Well, good morning. Hey, do you ever get stuck not really knowing or having a good idea what to do next, whether that's which project, which book to choose, what, whatever the thing is that you have to choose and, and to do, do you, do you ever get stuck? Well, as a pastor, it happened that when it was time to decide what the topic ought to be for this next series of messages, I got stuck. You know, for me, most of the time, I have a pretty good sense of what needs to be talked about. Uh, maybe to speak about the, the issues of the day, you know, like in this past month, the past series, we talked together and I preached about worry, you know, anxious for nothing. And it just made sense in the midst of living with this pandemic. Um, or maybe the one before that was the middle of the summer and it's a big time movie season. Um, or sometimes we talked about, um, with me, about things that just people needed to hear about from their pastor. But this time, I just didn't have a sense what to talk about, what, what to preach about. I didn't have any hints. And, well, that happened once before in just the last seven plus years I've been preaching. But so what I choose to do then, or what I might even say what I was led to do was to preach from the lectionary. And, and there's lots of preacher who's, who's always preached from the lectionary. So that's what we're going to do with the lectionary. But <laughs> I'm going to guess that many of you might say, well, what's a lectionary? Well, it's a schedule of readings from the Bible that, that are used the world over. And it's a schedule that runs for three years. And if you read all of them Sunday by Sunday, you'll have been through the entire Bible. There's always a passage from the Old Testament, a passage from the New Testament, a reading from one of the four Gospels, and a psalm. So what we're going to do is to take up the message from the Gospel readings each week from now till Thanksgiving. It's the book of Mark. And to be ready, I read the entire story from Mark just a, a few times. It's the story written to answer the question of who is Jesus. So we're picking up the story with the lectionary, and that means that we start in chapter 9. So I think maybe I'd better go back and set the stage. You know, kind of like a TV show, previously on, previously on the Gospel of Mark, we're going to ask, who wrote it? Why did he write it? And what happened up till now where we pick up the story? And then we'll take up that passage for today in Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. So who wrote it? Well, when you read Mark cover to cover, from front to back, you'll find out that it never says who wrote it. But from the earliest of New Testament days, it's always been thought of as John Mark. You know, the John Mark that traveled with the Apostle Paul. But here's the thing. It's also pretty well established that John Mark wasn't actually writing his own story. He was the secretary for Peter. And you know what? I think I see a lot of Peter in this book of Mark. Peter, just like you might have seen him on the TV series The Chosen, it's right down to brass tacks. He jumps into the story right from the start. No birth story, no genealogy, it's just bam. There it is. Here's how it starts in Mark chapter 1, 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written about in the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I'm sending my messenger before you, and he will prepare your way, a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. John was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted to God to forgive their sins. Well, he just jumps right in, not even a basic introduction. You know, kind of like the person who just walks up to you, runs up to you, and just starts talking. Not even a, hi, how are you? You just want to go, slow down, slow down. Now, that sounds like Peter. He was the disciple that always, was always just a bit impulsive. He's the one that jumps out of the boat to walk on water. And after he jumps, he goes, now, what was I thinking? 
Peter's the disciple that in the garden cuts off the ear of this guy, Malchus. Jesus might have said something like, oh, sorry about Peter, he can fly off the handle, so yeah, let me fix that. Or it's the Peter who says, I'll follow you, Jesus, even if it means I'll die. It's that Peter. That's the one that's telling the story that John Mark writes down in the Gospel of Mark. So the story is told in the Gospel of Mark is just right to the point. It's the shortest of the four Gospels. And he absolutely nails the whole point of the story in the first few words. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son. He wants us to know and understand this is about the Son of God. Of God! In the first part, in the first part of the story, he tells the story of the miracles, the calming of the storm, the feeding of the 5,000, casting out demons and healing. He, Jesus, the Lord of all nature, caring for the sick, the hungry, master of all creation, including demons, and it all leads up to the main point. See, the crowds are following Jesus around, and Mark, speaking for Peter, leads us right up to the big point, to the climax of the story, at least from the point of the plot of the story. We think it's the climax where Jesus asks, Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of God. Bam! There it is. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, God's Son. Now, if we drew up the plot, it's almost exactly the halfway point, the climax. Who is this Jesus? He is the Messiah, the Savior, the one that would rescue them from oppression and restore the kingdom. And what they didn't get was what that would mean. And as we'll see in this next episode, that's the point. And then right after leading us all right to the point to see Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, in Mark 8, verse 35, Jesus calls the crowd together and tells them if they want to follow him, they have to take up their cross and follow. That's shocking. The Savior, the Messiah, says, take up. Pick up, pick up the method of execution of a criminal, an absolutely brutal way to kill a person, crucifixion. The Romans would force the condemned person to carry the tool of their own death to the execution site. This is the first glimpse that the message of the gospel is totally contrary to the values of the surrounding culture. It's a message and a commitment that might lead to, and feel like it leads to, execution. Pick up your cross is not some romantic, cute saying, not some salty the singing song, but cheerfully singing a kid's song, pick up your cross and follow me. No, this is serious. It's, it's to say that the gospel the good news of Jesus is not to meet the desires and demands of the larger society. It's the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of men. And the story takes a huge turn in chapter 9. In the first part of chapter 9, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up a mountain. And Jesus is changed. We call it transfigured. And Peter, James, and John get a sneak peek of what the resurrected Jesus might be like. And he's joined there by Moses and Elijah. Peter, James, and John get an eyeful of who and what Jesus really is. Jesus is God. And then they're confronted by their own weakness. They, they can't even throw out a simple demon from a stricken boy, and Jesus has to take over. And that brings us to our passage for today. It starts in Mark chapter 9, verse 30. So let's read our passage for this morning from Mark chapter 9. From there, Jesus and his followers went through Galilee. But he didn't want anyone to know it, and this was because he was teaching his disciples, the human one, the Son of Man, will be delivered into human hands. They will kill him, 
and three days after he's killed, he will rise up. But they didn't understand this kind of talk, and they were afraid to ask him. So they entered Capernaum, and when they had come into a house, he asked them, what were you arguing about during the journey? And they didn't respond, since on the way, they'd been debating with each other about who was the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be least of all and the servant of all. Jesus reached for a little child and placed him among the twelve and embraced him. And then he said, Whoever welcomes me, who, excuse me, whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me isn't actually welcoming me, but rather the one who sent me. These are the words of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my heart, uh, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Okay, so that passage starts out from there. Jesus and his followers went through Galilee. From there, it's like a signal that the story's changing. It's an unexpected change. If it were a TV show, it would happen after a commercial break or after an intermission. From there, Mark 9, verse 30, from there, Jesus began to teach that the Son of Man would be crucified and then rise again from the dead. Now, in ancient Near Eastern cultures, honor and status were of utmost importance. Who gets the good seats? Who's honored? Who's held in the highest esteem? Who has the most stuff? He who dies with the most toys wins. Who has rank, position, status? And we really have to ask that question. Is that really any different than today? Isn't that what actually drives most of the world? Most of our climbing the career ladder or other sorts of things? Well, anyway, back to the story. Jesus and the disciples were on their way back to Capernaum in Galilee, back home to the house. And the disciples were arguing which of them was the greatest? Who would have the seat of honor? So Jesus sits down. He takes the traditional posture of the teacher, the rabbi, the seat of authority, and he teaches whoever wants to be first, whoever wants to have the place of honor, must be the servant of everyone. It's a complete reversal of the values of the world around them. It's a complete reversal of the values of the world around us. It, real, it is really, really clear just how badly the disciples missed what Jesus was saying about his pending death and resurrection. He had to just hammer them with it. And when we see the disciples ask for honor, who's the greatest? They completely miss what Jesus had been teaching. And as Peter and John are writing this story, just about 30 years later, they're admitting just how badly they misunderstood the message. The kingdom would be won. Evil would be defeated, but not in the way that they thought, as a conqueror on a war horse. Jesus said you had to be like a servant a slave, not worried about the greatest. Then, to make the point even more clear, Jesus calls over a child, sits a child on his lap and says, you have to welcome children. Again, this isn't what we think about, about children. Children then were property. They could be discarded. They weren't even thought of as particularly human until they reached adolescence, childbearing years, child-producing age. 
Oh, Jesus teaches we have to be like a servant, like a child. Jesus is saying, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, that's good. That's good. But the call is to radical self-sacrifice, radical ordinary hospitality, learning to treat with dignity the people whom God came to save, welcoming the lowest of status, a servant. That's the same thing as welcoming God. Welcoming the lowest, a child, a non-person, is to adopt the mindset of God. Jesus said, whoever welcomes a child, a non-person, welcomes me and welcomes the Father. And I tell you what, this teaching from Jesus sounds good, sounds nice. But oh, how easy it is to get sucked in by our own nature of self that just keeps coming through over and over again. I mean, most of us want the place of honor. We want the status. It, it's not easy to take up being a servant or a slave. Most of us would prefer to hang out with the people of influence rather than the children. We want to sit at the grown-ups table. It's just all too easy to fall into the trap of serving all the while thinking deep down, look how well I'm serving these poor souls. These poor souls, I'm serving them rather than growing a servant's heart who sees those that we serve as one of us. It's easy to think that if Christians get it right, we'll be able to remake the world, the government, and it will bring in God's kingdom here on earth, but, but that is exactly the opposite of what Jesus is teaching. We're to take up our cross to live as children of God, children that are valued, treasured, and welcomed into God's presence. As followers of Jesus, we are outposts of the new creation, the new creation brought into the present because the teaching of scripture is that this world will be remade in his image. But in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, we live as undercover citizens of his kingdom that will last forever, where everyone is an adopted son or daughter of God, welcomed with all the rights and privileges into the family. So what does that mean for us? What does it all mean for us today? Well, first, as followers of Jesus Christ, we serve a different kind of master. We can expect to feel that, like we are in an upside down world where strangers, aliens in a strange land, that what is important to God is contrary to what is important to the world. And it's not our job as followers of Jesus to convert the world to our way of thinking. Our job is to be representatives of Jesus, to be servants. So the question is, who do you serve? Second, followers of Jesus are to have the attitude of a servant. And I see that attitude in, in some of you that I've met. And I suspect each of you can think of a person who somehow is always there when help is needed. They have a servant's heart. That is the heart of Jesus. We meet and even wonder, why are they like that? It, it, it's just too good to be true. Well, it's because it's Jesus at work in those people. Jesus, who is in the form of God but didn't think equality with God was something to be grabbed hold of. Instead, he took the form of a slave. Are you a servant? Are you a bond slave? That is, a slave by choice of Jesus. Third, Jesus said, whoever welcomes the least of these, the children, 
the non-persons, the poor, the widow, the orphan, the prisoner, whoever welcomes the least of these welcomes me. So the question is, who have you invited to church? Who have you invited to lunch? Who have you been with that you might even have thought, I wonder what people will think of me if they know I'm hanging out with these people, the tax collectors, the drug addicts, the poor, the disabled, the troubled. And you know what? I have to confess that I've been lax in this regard. I've hung out with the people that I want to hang out with. So who is this Jesus? We'll ask that question each and every week as we work our way through this book of Mark. Who is this Jesus? He is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But he's not what you think. He is Savior in an upside-down world, a world where if you call him Lord, you're a servant. If you call him Lord, you welcome non-persons to your presence. You practice radical, ordinary hospitality because that is who Jesus is. And one day, one day, we who are called by his name will see his glory face to face. See, the Apostle Paul explains it in Philippians chapter 2. Paul said, Adopt this attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. And then when he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for that reason, God highly honored him and gave him a name above every name so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the challenge of who Jesus is and this is the invitation to be his disciple. So follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us Jesus, who took on the form to be like, to look like one of us, to show us the way, the way to salvation with you, but that we are to be servants, servants to one another, servants to all of your creation, especially those, especially those in need. Father, I pray that each one of us hearing my voice would know you as Savior and Lord, because you are the one. You are the one. In all these things, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, hear this blessing from me. Unto him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne to God the Father, be honor and blessing and power and glory as he carries you for this day, tomorrow, and every day to come. In Christ's name, go in his strength and peace. Amen.